בסדר? Can you close the door on the way out? Thank you. Hi. Good, how are you? Are you going to the ISFN next week? Yeah. The ISFN? ISFN, yeah. No, you're not there. No, but, but he, could, he could still go. It's a very big conference, so I don't know. Not invited. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, just a quick reminder that uh, next week we won't have a class. I also put it on the Moodle, but we uh, uh, won't have a class because uh, the L6 students are going to the ISFN. And uh, so, this is planned. Don't think that it's like uh, uh, from the beginning we planned a course, so we won't teach on this week. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, again, quick reminder of what we, uh, what we did last class. So we talked about biomembranes and the cell architecture. It was very, like, the basic uh, cell architecture. And this is an introduction to the big chapter of transport of ions uh, and molecules across the cell membrane that we will start uh, today. Um, we, we talked about, like, different... Uh, uh, different terms like cytosol, cytoplasma, what is lumen, uh, extracellular space, or exoplasma uh, in regard to the cell. The cell is divided to organelles. Um, we went over the lipid, uh, like, like the structural organization. We said that the, um, <coughs> this is the basic structure of the, uh, of the cell membrane. And that's composed of two leaflets that are, uh, that are made from fatty acids or uh, phospholipids that have uh, one side, a hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic side and a hydrophilic side, which is the polar head group. And this is the area where you have the water. This is in, like inside the cell and this is outside the cell and this are, these are the leaflets. And they create an impermeable to water, more or less, uh, a barrier that's uh, more or less impermeable to water and other uh, hydrophobic substance, hydrophilic uh, substances. Um, we said that the uh, uh, hydrophobic effect and Van der Waals interaction stabilize this structure. Uh, we also mentioned that the, m the, the membrane is fluid. We can't look at it as something that is rigid. You have l uh, what we call lateral movement all the time. Like most of the phospholipids, I actually don't know if most, but a lot of the phospholipids uh, in the membrane can move laterally, like along this axis. And also proteins and other molecules that are not anchored, for example, to the, to the cytoskeleton or to extracellular uh, proteins can also um, migrate or diffuse along the membrane. And we mentioned the cholesterol. <coughs> we talked about uh, the rigidity and the composition and lipid composition and how it affects uh, the membrane itself, the consistency, for example, of the membrane and the thickness of the membrane and the curvature of the membrane. Uh, in terms of like, like the different uh, phospholipids that, uh, co that compose the membrane itself, and also that cholesterol can have like a, an effect on the thickness and also the viscosity uh, of the plasma membrane. Um, <coughs> we said that there are also we, we can find different types of, uh, of lipids uh, inside the membrane, like inside uh, facing inwards to the cell or to the cytosol or facing out for outwards or extracellular uh, lipids. And this is because one, one of the reasons that uh, they, they have, they're exposed to different sets of enzymes that cleave them in specific uh, regions and modify uh, uh, the phospholipids. Uh, and these enzymes are different outside the cell and, and inside the cell. And also because the synthesis of these uh, phospholipids is not symmetrical. Like they're made in the, <coughs> in the smooth endoplasmic ER uh, smooth and duplexus reticulum, sorry. Uh, and in other uh, regions, for example, in the Golgi, um, and the, the export and the way that they're made is not symmetrical. Uh, and that's why when they're incorporated into the plasma membrane, into the cell membrane, uh, they're not symmetrical. Like the composition or the, the, the type of the phospholipid is not the same in the cytosolic phase or the exoplasmatic phase. Of the, of the membrane. 
uh, we divided like the, uh, the, the proteins that interact with the membrane to three types. We have peripheral uh, proteins that are around the membrane but do not interact directly with the membrane itself, but interact with proteins and other components that interact with the membrane itself. Then we have integral proteins. For example, uh, channel proteins are integral proteins, uh, like we'll talk in depth today. And another type of interaction is the lipid anchored. So it can be proteins that could either be uh, anchored uh, in the exoplasmatic uh, phase or the cytosolic phase uh, of the cell membrane. <coughs> okay, so integral transmembrane proteins, which are these, uh, we will often see them uh, in uh, structures of channels. A lot of time they will have a, a membrane spanning alpha helix and not, for example, a beta sheet or other structures. And this is, again, because uh, we said that uh, if I remind you to the structure of the alpha helix, uh, it has the capability because all the hydrogen bonds are actually occupied in the structure itself of the, of the alpha helix. It means that no water, like the water can't interact with the backbone. So because water can't interact directly with the backbone, it means that the identity of the alpha helix is only determined or whether it will be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Do the, uh, like is determined by the identity of the side chains of the amino acids or the identity of the amino acids. <coughs> uh, we also showed uh, different types of uh, anchoring uh, that often in the exterior part you will find the uh, sugars uh, in the in the anchor uh, molecules that anchor the proteins, and uh, uh, and in the cytosol it will be uh, uh, often like uh, protein-based anchors. <coughs> protein-based anchors and like carbon-based anchors. So then we went very briefly in uh, describing all the organs in the cell, uh, the plasma membrane, the mitochondria, where I told you and I, we don't have to mention what I said last time, uh, lysosomes, um, the nuclear envelope, nucleolus, uh, we talked about chromatin a little bit, what is uh, chromatin, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, uh, secretory vesicles, and then we talk specifically about organelles that are unique to neurons, uh, like synapses and myelin, uh, myelin sheaths, uh, that are actually formed by glia cells, but uh, they, they are uh, in charge of the conduction of signals along the axons uh, of neurons. Uh, I showed you a lot of uh, EM images of how like uh, this is like a, a caricature or like a, of a, a of a button or a synapse. So this is the dendrite and this is the axon that interacts with this. So this is a in in this case it looks very similar to to what you see here. So this is an EM image and you can see here the synaptic cleft uh, and the mitochondria and secretory vesicles that are in, in charge of releasing the neurotransmitter to the synaptic cleft. Uh, and also you can see here like uh, a, a nice example of the myelin that you can see here that it's composed of a lot of uh, different like spiraling uh, membranes that actually isolate the axon from the extracellular environment. And uh, we also talked about the neuroligin neuroxine complex, uh, which is again something that is very important to neurons because uh, these, scaffold, uh, these scaffold proteins, the neuroxine neuroligin, are the ones that are in charge of interacting or holding the synaptic cleft uh, together. And these are very, uh, very specific to the type of the synapse that they hold. For example, in uh, glutamate or excitatory synapses, you will often find neurolegin 1 and beta neuroxin, whereas in uh, inhibitory synapses that have like GABA receptors, you will find beta neuroxin and alpha neuroxin and neurolegin 2. And uh <coughs> And this is one of the, these proteins are not only holding the synapse together, but are probably very important for identification of the, uh, or mediating between the two cells that need to interact with one, with one another. And I mentioned that mutations in neuroligin, in the neuroligin have been associated to autism, uh, for example. And again, a lot of EM images showing you that uh, this is not, what? We're not talking about that, I said. I'm with the microphone now. Okay, so uh, this is how it looks in uh, cartoons. This is nothing like that. This is actually how it looks in reality. Uh, 
and you can see here, for example, the next one, the dendrites and the synaptic cleft. So everything is in your brain is filled with stuff, filled with material, and it's like looks like a mess, but uh, for biology it's not. And uh, specifically organelles, uh, when we look at them in the EM, so just for you to see how it looks in uh, real life, and uh, then this, uh, these are mitochondria, uh, this is the nucleus of the cell, a nuclear membrane that surrounds the nucleus, a secretory vesicles, because I think this is a, like a, a, a secrete, like a hormone releasing or something cell. Uh, not, not in all cells you'll find these secretory vesicles floating around. Uh, Golgi vesicles and then endoplasmic reticulum, which are these like creasings, the plasma membrane of a cell that you can see that there's nothing very special about the plasma membrane. It's not like thicker or something like that than any other membrane uh, in the cell. Um, then a few more images of the mitochondria, the oxidases that are in charge of the degrading proteins. The rough VR where we can see the um, so that membrane-bound proteins are often uh, made in the rough VR, and these spots are ribosomes that are actually bound to the rough VR. And this is an, an, a, like a magnification uh, of an eukaryotic cell nucleus. So this is the nucleus. This is nucleolus, where the region where rRNA is uh, produced for for the ribosome. And <coughs> uh, we also talked a little bit about heterochromatin and like that, the different densities uh, that DNA can be in. This is a, another very nice image of a mitochondria where you can see the internal cleft. We're not going to talk about the structure of the mitochondria uh, at all, we, although it's very it's fascinating because this is again the power plant uh, of the cell and this is where all the ATP is made. And that's okay. We talked a little bit about the cytoskeleton, and we defined like, uh, although we talked in the past, but we have actin, which are the smallest filaments, uh, the alpha and beta tubulin, which we said are like the highways of the cell, they're like the long range connections uh, or cytoskeleton proteins uh, of the cell. And then we have the uh, intermediate filaments, which are like, we just, we know a lot about actin and, uh, and tubulin, then all the other filaments were like just, okay, they're intermediate filaments. And they're very, they're much more diverse. And uh, this is a nice image. Is this a nice image of like the microtubules that are imaged in uh, cell culture cells? And what you sh you can see here in the yellow, it's not the nucleus. It doesn't actually have to be in the nucleus. It's uh, what we call a centrosome. This is like the uh, like this is the center in terms of uh, in terms of the microtubules and uh, uh, other cellular function of the cell. This is like the, the location where all the microtubules are spanning from, and it, it come. It, they start from the central, uh, from the centrosome, and they span uh, throughout the cell. So this is like the. Uh, it's not the microtubules are not just randomly distributed in the cell. They have like structure. Where is the centrosome normally? So, for in neurons, most of the time it will be next to the. It will be in the soma, like close to the nucleus. Also in these cells, a lot of time it's close to the nucleus. No, it's not inside the nucleus, it's outside the nucleus. And uh, for example, when the, when the cell, when cells are dividing, we're not, we, we're not talking about that at all, but when cells are dividing, then the centrosomes split, and then there's like one centrosome and the other centrosome, and they start like this tug of war uh, between them, eventually separating the DNA uh, <coughs> into two cells. And uh, I showed you images of how it looks in, uh, in neurons. So uh, here it's a really nice staining or uh, immunostaining that uh, in this case they did it with an antibody that targets, uh, that targets specifically uh, microtubulin protein 2. Uh, and this is what you can see in green here. And in red, it's an antibody that targets actin filaments. So again, we said that the actin filaments are more local filaments. Uh, that are highly enriched in uh, in dendrite in uh, <coughs> sorry in synapses, and again the microtubules are like the main uh, highways, and they're along like the dendrites and axons also um, of the cell. Then we started talking a little bit about purif purifying 
themselves and their parts, which is very important. Again, uh, I don't want you to get like uh, the context that everything, like how I want you to get a feeling of how we study uh, these things that we know. For example, if we want to uh, study specific types of cell or specific organelles and, and, and stuff like that, then uh, we have various ways to, to separate the things that we want to study. And if, for example, we're focused, uh, we're focused on a specific type of cell, uh, for example, here, this is a cell that releases the uh, acetylcholine, and this is in, like in a dish. Uh, these, these cells are actually grown in, uh, on, a, on a petri dish. They were extracted from a brain and then let to grow on a, on a petri dish. And the cells that you see in red are cells that, we, uh, that, ex that release acetylcholine. And these are the cells, for example, that we're interested in uh, in my lab, but in other labs, every lab has their own, uh, most of all, uh, cell of choice most of the time. And <coughs> in ways that I didn't tell you a lot about, but we'll talk about in uh, in future classes, we have ways to specifically mark these uh, uh, these cells in a fluorescent protein. In this case, it's the tomato that expresses uh, homogeneously and strongly only in the cells that we're interested in. And then we can use a technique that's called fluorescent activated cell sorter, in short, FAX, in order to separate these cells from all the other cells that you see here, for example, the black cells, like the cells that don't have uh, fluorescent tagging. And the way that this machine does it is that um, it uh, actually like puts each one of the cells inside a water droplet it's inside a small water droplet that passes through this nozzle or that is created through uh, in this nozzle. And when it starts coming out of the nozzle, it's being uh, like uh, a laser can detect uh, the fluorescence of the, uh, the, the fluorescence of the cell inside this droplet. And, uh, and depending on what we say, like if we said that uh, we want to keep the cell, we want to throw the cell, then by the time that it gets here, or actually, <coughs> uh, the cell is actually being charged. Uh, the the droplet of water is actually being charged with either a negative, positive, or no charge, no electric charge. And you have these deflection plates here that have a very strong and homogeneous um, electrical uh, field. And this electrical field will cause a deflection of either the positively charged mo uh, droplet to this tube or the negative, like the opposite, never mind. But it can divide like the cells into tubes. You can actually have like four, up to four tubes that you can divide the cells into. So uh, the, the machine also has the capability to charge with a, like a stronger charge or a weaker charge, the, uh, the water droplet. And again, this is a, a pretty amazing like, machine in the, in the way that it works and in the accuracy that it does it. And you can get like up to 10,000 cells per second. Like this, uh, this isolation can give you like up, up to 10,000 cells per second of, per second of uh, separation. So it happens uh, really fast, and it's actually efficient enough for us to really isolate large quantities of the cells that we're interested in. And this, for example, like one of the, this is like a typical plot that you will get from uh, this type of machine. And uh, this is, for example, uh, M cherry. It doesn't matter. M cherry and T tomato are the same. Uh, are the same uh, wavelength. So this indication, this graph, like this, uh, the y-axis actually describes how much was the cell red in this case. And this is just like a, you can say like a, a background a fluorescence that uh, also the positive, like these cells and also these cells should be more or less similar in the, in the intensity to this fluorophor. This is like the green channel and this is the red channel. So if the, so, uh, when we the the fax with this uh, scanning laser can give us like this profile of and each one of these dots are actually is actually a cell, and it can tell you uh, how much how much red and how much green does this cell have, and then we can mark these uh, what we call gates or these uh, rectangles. Uh, we can mark around the cells of interest or the populations of cells of interest. And then the machine knows that every cell that falls into this category, like that has uh, inside this range, that has this level of M cherry and this level of Fitzy, or this level of red and this level of green, for example, 
then it knows that it has to give it a positive charge, and it will separate it to the value that we, that we say. Okay, and all the other ones, and, and this, for example, like the control group, so we have like the cells that we want, and it's also important most of the time to isolate also a population of controls. And all the other cells that don't fall, for example, anywhere in these two uh, populations will just get thrown out into the garbage. Okay? Questions? So, questions? No. Uh, a more old-fashioned way to separate uh, this, this can also be used to separate cells, but this is actually a way uh, which nowadays is more common to separate uh, organelles is by centrifugation or by ultra centrifugation. And <coughs> because the organelles are actually different from one another in their density, each organelle like, uh, is composed of different, for example, a different concentration of uh, phospholipids, different concentrations of proteins that are, that are inside the, the organelle. Then they also have different densities from one another and also have different sizes. So one of the ways that we can, uh, that we can separate these uh, is by centrifugal force, and this, for example, uh, this is actually before we start talking about densities. This is just by by weight. So, if we take like a uh, brain tissue, we more or less grind it in order to break the membranes of the cells. But we grind it in a delicate way, so it keeps the organelles intact, but but ruptures all the cells. <coughs> then, uh, then we can take this uh, this extract. And by applying a continuously growing centrifugal, centrifugal force, we can actually precipitate each time uh, organelles of the cell that are, uh, that are larger, and that are smaller and smaller. So for example, one of the biggest organelles in the cell is the nuclei. So if we take this homogenate uh, or this uh, soup of uh, proteins and organelles, and we uh, centrifuge this by a uh, centrifugal force of uh, 600G, then we'll get only the nucleus or the nuclei uh, in the pellet in the, in the bottom of the tube, and then we can uh, isolate the nuclei from here, take the rest of the extract, centrifuge it again in 15,000G, and uh, in this uh, speed, or in this centrifugal force, we'll get mitochondria, lysosomes, and peroxisomes, and et cetera, and et cetera, until we get, a, uh, uh, if we go up to 300,000G, which is ultra centrifugation, then we can start precipitating uh, like ribosomal uh, subunits and ribosomes. But this is more or less the limit. For example, it's, it's uh, considered that if, if you want to, for example, isolate a specific type of protein, it's considered to be impossible to, like, uh, to precipitate a protein because think about it, if I, I need 300,000 G to precipitate like rib ribosomes, which are huge, to precipitate a protein, I will have to use like um, forces that we don't have in the lab in order to precipitate that. So this is a, a type of separation according to uh, according to weight. And like I started saying before, uh, you also can do a separation according to density. Okay. So we know that different types of or uh, again different types of organelles have different densities. And if we do like what we call a discontinuous density gradient, and you do it, for example, you can do it with sucrose. There, so uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you uh, have seen like the, the the viscosity or the feeling of like a, if you were making like a simple sugar syrup, is like more viscous than water, right? So it's actually more dense. Like molecularly, it's more dense. So what we can do is like exactly like the the syrup that you're making uh, uh, in your home, then we can make uh, um, different solutions that have increasing concentrations of uh, sucrose, uh, in this case, and <coughs> the increasing concentration of sucrose uh, will, uh, will actually help us to separate um, organelles according to their, uh, according to their uh, density. For example, you can think about like a mitochondria that if we have the organelle fraction or the soup that I told you about before, and we now centrifuge it very, very fast, then the mitochondria will pass through the density gradients that are, uh, that the mitochondria is like more dense then, but then 
what, wh when we'll encounter, for example, the 1.19 density, and the mitochondria is 1.18, it will not be able to penetrate. <coughs> um, it will not be able to penetrate this uh, this barrier, and this will serve as like a cushion for all the mitochondria that will come uh, from here, and you will get a, like a band that you know that in, in this location in the tube, you can find uh, mitochondria according to their density. Okay? <coughs> and this is actually a very efficient way because the way that I showed you before, like a very efficient way to separate organelles because the way that I showed you before is a little bit messy. Like in terms of, it's considered much less accurate uh, about the identity of the of the organelles that you're isolating. For example, uh, in this type of pelleting, you also get mitochondria, chloroplasts, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and you also get a lot of cell debris between us. You get a lot of uh, cellular debris that, by chance, got the same size that they will precipitate here. But in the density, it's a completely different story, and you can get to very accurate densities, uh, for example, mitochondria, and then you get really high enrichment only for mitochondria uh, in this band. So how can we apply the same concept in order to, uh, to isolate the organelles that were interested in neuroscience. One of the oldest protocols, it was actually invented by the sister, it, it, it was used by the sister of uh, Donald Hebb in 1956. And uh, do you know who Donald Hebb is? Like neurons that fire together, wire together? Did you hear that? Okay, so I actually have a theory that uh, he stole everything from his sister. But, <laughs> but we're not going to... We're not going to talk about this now, because she, she she started isolating synapses before people knew that there were synapses. Okay, she, so she she called them like a new type of organelle that has like enzymatic activity, but she didn't know like that there were synapses. And uh, again, like like in the case of the mitochondria, we know that synapses and specifically what we call synaptosomes, which are actually the presynaptic uh, like postsynaptic, it's, it's a presynaptic button and postsynaptic button, I think it's the other way around, yeah. This is, this is the postsynaptic, this is the presynaptic uh, buttons. Um, actually have specific types of densities that, and then we can isolate only these, okay? So for example, if we want to investigate uh, a certain type of protein, or now you also know that we can investigate a certain type of RNA molecule that is abundant in synapses, then what we do is that we we take a mouse brain. In human brain, it's much, e it's much harder because normally the synapses are already degraded um, by the time we get our hands on it. But we, we normally will take like a, a mouse brain, and again, we will grind it in a very delicate way that will only keep, uh, that will preserve the, what we call synaptoneurosomes, or synaptosomes in short, uh, which you can actually imagine if you have a... that if you have two neurons that are connected to each other, okay, so this is, for example, a dendrite, and this is an axon of this neuron, then we have ways to uh, very delicately, um, like, it's not a tree grind, it's like mix uh, the tissue in a way that only the connections, like the axons and dendrite will, will like, uh, will break. And because the, the plasma membrane is so flexible, and because the, the, the forces that hold the plasma membrane, like I always tell you, are hydrophobic effect and van der Waals interactions, then the membrane has a very, uh, very good capability of closing on itself. Okay, so you can imagine that over here you will have, it's more accurate to show it like this, you know, like that you have a membrane that goes something like this, and when we apply mechanical force uh, on this structure, it will break, and this, this part will close, and this part will close. And then in the end, what we'll have is that we'll have these presynaptic, postsynaptic uh, buttons that are attached together through the uh, neurolag and neurexin proteins, and then because we know their specific density, we can again apply a sucrose gradient or a different type of gradient. It doesn't really matter. It's, what's important is it's a density gradient. And 
for example, in band number five here, we will find the, the synaptoneurosomes in this band. So if we put the entire like mashed up brain on the top of this uh, top of this vial, apply a very strong centrifugal force. Uh, after uh, half an hour, we take out the vial and we'll find a band here that if we, uh, that we can extract specifically only the synapses from or enriched for synapses. Okay, and this is one of the ways that we can uh, isolate these structures. Okay, so, yeah. The density gradient. So it's a lot of it is due to the is due to the so for for that reason I put here like Stokes law that describes the movement of a particle through a liquid uh, through a liquid phase and uh, a lot of it is due to the actual the size of the particle okay like if we're not talking about the density so much then most of the time what will be the like the major factor is the is the movement of the is the density but also um like the it will like the diameter will actually so here it's a different it's actually a different thing it's more like a dynamical process for example because it goes like the other way around right so in this uh, the, the velocity goes uh <coughs> if you look like for example in this equation so and and then you can like input different diameters or different uh, variabilities uh, and and from that get the uh, get the velocity of the movement of the uh, of that structure through mm -hmm. the liquid. But there is also a, a second factor here, which is the the fact that if you have small particles, then uh, that smaller particles will have like a uh, will have a they will have a higher tendency to like float around in the liquid and not to aggregate into a, into a clump. And by applying like a larger centrifugal force, in the end, you like push them more in order for them to aggregate. So you can understand why like, so it's more that larger elements will be better at sticking together and pelleting together at lower speeds. So because they have a, l a less tendency to like move around and uh, diffuse around because they're larger. So you actually like when you apply the centrifugal force, then they, the larger elements sink to the they sink to the bottom and they stick there, and they stay together because they're all they're large and clumpy, and the other small molecules will just uh, will not uh, like the force that that applies on them is not strong enough in order to cause them to stick together and and they they like float around the liquid. But generally, it, but generally in order to understand like the the precipitation, you just need to follow like Stokes law and put like uh, the equation and and if you look for example here that the diameter of the particle is a large determinant of the uh, of the speed uh, that you will get here which describes the speed of movement through the liquid so if you apply like uh, the, uh, 600, uh, g. Uh, g and then you don't like you don't pour out the uh, solution so yeah. then Yeah, 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 exactly. So you get all of them together. Okay, so for that we finish this chapter. And again, I told you that this is an introductory chapter. It might have been a little bit boring, but I hope now it's uh, a more interesting thing. So, what time is it? Okay. So transport of ions and small molecules across uh, the cell membrane. So first of all, we need to define why should the cell transport things okay, across the membrane. So we can divide it into like four major categories, but I'm sure there are more. Uh, first of all, which is the most, the simplest uh, thing is nutrition. For example, the cell is not isolated. The cell needs to get energy, it needs to get oxygen. It needs to get amino acids, for example. 
So it has to transport from outside all of these substances through the cell membrane. Then, for, for neurons specifically, but for all the other cells, it's also true. Uh, it has to uh, transport ions across the cell membrane in order to uh, harness potential energy. And we'll, we'll talk specifically in this chapter how this happens. Pro probing and signaling, which is actually communication. Uh, so again, in neurotransmission, for example, uh, the neurotransmitter binds to a channel that opens and allows, again, ions to penetrate the cells. So these ions are actually carrying a signal that the cells now need to be aware of. So it's like a signaling. And in certain types of cells in our body, specifically neurons are not very good at this, but other cells and glia have the ability to change the cell volume, and they can do it by entering, by, by allowing permeability of water uh, inside the cell and outside the cell to change the, uh, the volume of the cell. So this is just one of the like, examples of reason for why, why the cell needs to transport stuff uh, across the cell membrane. And uh, it's important, uh, uh, and this is like the first uh, place that we're saying that only a very small, uh, like, or, or very small family of molecules is able to freely diffuse along the cell membrane. For example, uh, small molecules that are not charged or nonpolar are able to uh, are able to penetrate <coughs> through the cell membrane more or less freely. And uh, specific types of molecules, for example, ethanol. This is one of the reasons that you get drunk very fast. Uh, are able to penetrate biological membranes uh, relatively easy, and this is because they're relatively small and nonpolar. Okay, because again, I remind you that this barrier is a hydro uh, is a hydrophobic barrier. So hydrophobic molecules like ethanol and these uh, and these gases uh, can pass through this barrier. Okay, and uh, other molecules. So I'll uh, skip the example of urea. Water is more or less permeable. It's not really permeable. It depends on the, on the pressures. But the cell has, again, ways to specifically uh, allow water to, uh, to penetrate the membrane. But all the other molecules that you can think of, for example, small charged molecules or large molecules, even if they're charged or uncharged, cannot penetrate uh, this barrier. So, for example, glucose, fructose, amino acids, ATP, uh, proteins, nucleic acids, all these, and all the all the charged ions, all the ions, uh, cannot penetrate uh, the plasma membrane. So <coughs> we can actually uh, the way that the cell allows transport uh, into the cell can be divided into like the proteins that allow transport of molecules uh, inside the cell or outside the cell can be divided into three categories. First of all, it's important to know that as far as we know, again, as far as we know, all transport molecules or un all transport proteins are spanning the membrane. Okay, so it might be trivial, but you can also think about a, like a more like a fairy model or something, like a protein that will sit on one side of the membrane and then, and then accompany the ion to the other side. But, uh, I don't know, and uh, probably, and we don't know if there is uh, any example of that, but what we do know is that all the examples that we know of, uh, of uh, proteins that transport molecules across the membrane are transmembranous, which actually means that they have the capability to, uh, to create a hydrophilic environment inside the plasma membrane and allow the transport of the molecules uh, that they're designed to transport. And we can divide them, uh, these transporters or transport proteins into three groups. Uh, one is ATP-powered pump. So the ATP-powered pump and, uh, <coughs> uh, can, uh, through the power of hydrolysis of ATP, which is again always in the most, like ATP will mostly be found in the intracellular part. Uh, so ATP can allow, uh, allow this pump to uh, to move an ion or uh, or a molecule against its concentration gradient, and when I say concentration, again we'll talk in length about concentration gradients. But 
in general, it's like taking you can you can imagine it as a uh, as a pump that has to pump water like uh, up river or uh, against like the gravitational force. Um, but it's actually not a very good example, and we're but I'll give you better examples uh, soon. So it can actually uh, like uh, so. In this case, uh, if you have a high concentration of the ion here and a low concentration of the ion here, uh, then this pump can actually pump against the concentration gradient, and for that you need energy, and this comes in the form of ATP. The second type is uh, ion channels, which we'll do here. You on only see gated ion channels, but there are also uh, non-gated ion channels, meaning that they don't have any uh, portal or conformational change that happens in order for them to uh, to open, and because these ion channels don't uh, don't use energy, then the only way that the ions can move is with their concentration gradient. Okay, so if the ion is highly concentrated here and the channel opens, then the ions will move towards the low concentration. And the third type is transporters, and the difference, the major difference between the transporters, for example. We, you can see like uh, you can have a uniporter transporter, which is just in charge of moving an ion against it uh, with its concentration gradient or other molecules with its concentration gradient. So if you compare it to the channel, for example, it has the same type of like movement. It doesn't require energy, but the major difference is that all transporters, uh, in each time they transport a molecule, they undergo conformational change. Okay, so you can imagine that. Uh, uh, ion is coming here, and then the transporter will undergo a conformational change, and the and the molecule will uh, enter the cell. In a channel, it's not like that. It's simply not simply, but it's a pore that allows uh, free movement uh, of ions or molecules uh, across the channel. And <coughs> other type types of transporters, they again they're transporters because they have to undergo conformational change in order to in order to transport uh, the molecules, you have uh, two types, which are symporters harness the energy of one ion that's going down its concentration gradient in order to transport one ion uh, against its concentration gradient. And antipotel, uh, the difference between symporter and antipotel is that in symporter, uh, <coughs> they're moving the ions in the same direction, the one that is uh, required for energy and the other one that uh, uh, requires the actual energy. And in antipotel, the two ions or two molecules are moved uh, in opposite direction. But in general, these are very, uh, very similar in principle. So like I started mentioning, we can, divide, we can subdivide these groups, these three groups, into active and passive. Passive meaning that they don't need any type of energy in order to uh, in order to pass uh, the molecules that they need to pass in this case of the ATP powered pump the energy comes in the form of ATP and in the case of the tr transporters uh, the energy comes from the concentration gradient of the red molecule or red ion here okay so yeah The black, yeah, the the black are like the. No. No, no, he's right. Like moving from low concentration to high concentration, this uh, this requires the the active, but the energy comes from the red ion. Okay, like the energy comes from the red ion because it's moving with its concentration gradient, so it's something that it's like a like a turbine. You can imagine what. For uni ah, for uniporter, yeah. yeah. For uniporter, they just, uh, because there's no you red. switch the color notation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's uh, very confusing. It's just to show that you really understand. You're not uh, focused on the colors. Okay, so, and this potential energy in the form of concentration gradient is one of the most important uh, aspects uh, of cells in general, but, uh, uh, but, neurons in particular, and uh, hold that thought, and in the next class we will
get in detail into each one of these uh, transportation uh, methods.
Okay, so the first type of uh, transport protein that we're going to talk about is the ATP-powered pump. And <coughs> the ATP-powered pump uh, is in charge of, and it's a, it's a type of, first of all, in terms of proteins, we say that it's an atp as. And again, what, what, whenever you have an as, if it's RNAs, DNAs, proteas, uh, it always something that breaks down the molecule that you find before. So ATP as is a is a protein that breaks down ATP or hydrolyzes ATP, and uh, it's it's kind it's, it sounds a little bit funny because that's not the function. It just uh, like describes the process, but still, uh, this is one of the categories that we define uh, proteins and enzymes. So the ATP powered pump is a type of uh, ATP as that harnesses the energy of the ATP hydrolysis in order to move ions or small molecules across the membrane and against the chemical concentration uh, or electrical potential or both or both so i i put in the i put in the website uh, because we're not going to get into that in too much depth and to give you like a better intuition i actually found an article that it's titled as like a intuition regarding the electrochemical potential in neurons or something or some stuff like that so you can find it actually in the Moodle now uh, this paper uh, that uh, it's, it's very short it's just a few pages so I really recommend for you to read it and it gives you like a nice uh, solid intuition about uh, diffusion and uh, and the electrochemical uh, gradient uh, in general but 
simply, if we if we start thinking about maybe maybe it's a little bit it sounds like trivial that if you have a place where you have a high concentration of a of a of a molecule or an ion, and another location where you have a low concentration of that ion, then in, I am sure that your intuition tells you that if we give these an, enough time, that they will be distributed evenly in space, right? So the diffusion, uh, like forces of diffusion, cause everything to be like randomly distributed. But what are the like? Why why does it happen? Do you know? Why does diffusion happen? Why do we have? Why do we see like, for example, if we take this system? Why are these molecules going to diffuse to this direction? Right, it's entropy. Okay, like a lot of things that we saw, uh, like examples before, uh, like in the case of protein folding and a lot of other uh, things like that. Sometimes it's the entropy of the water, sometimes it's the entropy of the molecule it itself. But in this case, it's really entropy because the because if we look specifically in each one of these molecules, the movement is completely random. Okay, like it has a brand new mov motion and it moves. But somehow, and this is uh, again something really amazing when you think about it, somehow there is some kind of force or energy or some, some type of uh, like a basic property of, uh, of physical systems that is this term of entropy that is actually a driving force or the energy that in the end will cause the molecules here to move to this direction and eventually be distributed homogeneously in space. So because, this, because of this force or because of this entropy, um, in order to break this entropy and to cause like a state of higher order, and I mean higher order meaning that you'll have higher concentration of the ion in this part of the cell or this part of the membrane <coughs> relative to the internal part of the, of the membrane, then you need to apply energy, okay? So every time you, you want to, you want to uh, decrease the entropy and increase the order of the system, you need to apply energy, and in, in this case, it's in the form of ATP. So we will actually focus uh, on two types of, uh, of pumps, of ATP pumps. One of them is the P-class pump, which is very common, and the other type is the V-class uh, proton pump, which we'll discuss in the... I think uh, only in next class, which will be in two weeks. Okay, so <coughs> the peak plus, uh, uh, class pump uh, is in charge of. You can find it in uh, the plasma membrane of the bacteria. That uh, in this case it pumps hydrogens. Uh, in the the example that we're going to give is two examples of one of them, which is the sodium potassium pump, uh, that is in charge of the, the electrochemical potential. In uh, in uh, eukaryotic cells, and the second example that we're going to show is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, specifically, here they say it's in muscle cells, but actually all the cells uh, in a, in the body have uh, internal storage of calcium. Uh, in <coughs> in neurons, for example, no normally it's the uh, it's the ER, or the endoplasmic reticulum also has a higher concentrations of uh, of calcium. Um, but in all these cases, the structure of the protein is pretty much the same. Okay, just small changes cause it to be uh, cause its specificity uh, to the specific ions or uh, or molecules that it knows how to transport. So <coughs> the ATP uh, the ATP binding site or the ATP hydrolysis site is is will Actually, I think it's safe to say that it will always be located in the cytosolic phase because this is where you have ATP. Uh, again, because ATP, you need to you need to imagine ATP as a very unstable molecule. Okay, this is one of the I always give like the example of a gasoline. Like ATP can give you a lot of energy very fast. So because it's so unstable, it actually uh, the time it takes for for example, if your body uh, when you die, it's it's a it's a matter of minutes. And that it, it takes only a couple of minutes for all the ATP molecules to spontaneously break in your body. Okay, so it's a very unstable molecule, and because of that, a lot of times we will, we will find it uh, only inside the cell, close to the mitochondria, that is uh, producing it all the time. Okay, the ATP. So, and in the exoplasmatic phase, 
we don't have mitochondria that are like freely floating around, so there's not, there isn't like an available source of ATP. So the cytosolic phase has the uh, the binding site and the hydrolysis site for the ATP, and <coughs> like I told you, this is actually in charge of uh, maintaining the concentration of sodium, uh, the sodium potassium pump, which we're going to show in a second, is in charge of maintaining the difference in the ion concentration from the uh, intracellular concentrations. Uh, this is actually an example of a, uh, of a blood cell, but it, it doesn't really matter because this, these concentrations are really more or less constant for all the cells in the body. It's not unique to neurons in any way. Uh, and it's always that the concentration of, uh, of potassium inside the cell will be high, and the uh, concentration of potassium outside the cell, in this case the body, is the blood, will be very low, and it's the other way around for the sodium. So the sodium will be low inside the cell and will be high uh, outside the cell. And these two ions are, uh, both, are both of them are positively charged. So the, these, uh, these uh, pumps are actually in charge. They, they are the ones that maintain this concentration gradient. If we didn't have these pumps, then the, uh, these gradients will just be like the... <coughs> Uh, the concentrations will be just be similar, or be equal between the internal part and the external part of the cell. <coughs> so, again, if we have high concentration of sodium outside the cell, and high concentration of, of uh, potassium inside the cell, then the ATP pump, what it actually does is that a single molecule of ATP it will be used in order to, um, to move three ions of sodium from inside the cell to the outside of the cell, and two, uh, here, two potassium ions from the outside of the cell into the cell, okay? So the method to do it is, again, like you've seen uh, in the past, is that these sodium ions uh, bind, then the ATP binds to this pocket. The hydrolysis of the ATP, the actually the charging of, the, of this uh, protein with a phosphate, gives the energy for a conformational change that actually opens, or it's actually a much more drastic conformational change. It's not very simple. It's not, here it's like underestimating. The entire protein is like shifted in a way that uh, instead of having like the cleft that is now facing uh, to the internal part of the cell, now the cleft is like open uh, to the external, uh, <coughs> uh, to the external part of the cell. And then these sodium ions will Will, uh, will diffuse away, like uh, eventually. This actually happens very fast, but uh, th there's not, uh, there isn't like a driving force that causes them to leave, they just diffuse out. Uh, and then uh, two potassium ions uh, will can bind to different locations, and when the phosphate will be released, then the conformational change will be, re will be reversed, and uh, the phosphate ions will, will uh, diffuse away into the internal part of the cell. Okay, so this process continues on and on and on. And actually, uh, it's written before, but 25% of the energy of the cell, some say that in neurons it's 60% of the energy, or the ATP molecules of the neurons, is harnessed in order to maintain this gradient, or to is, is wasted, it's not wasted, but it's uh, invested in maintaining the, this electrochemical gradient. So. Can you think about why would the cell do that? I'll give you a hint. Okay, action potential. But so why do we need it for action potential? Why not? Okay. But they can also like uh, why not just take the ATP? Why not uh, harness like a uh, uh, use the ATP in order to pump sodium inside the cell. Okay, like have pumps that will, uh, or, or, like, if you don't, if you don't have this gradient at all, for example, like let's uh, make an imaginary cell that doesn't have any gradient, and it has to have like higher concentration of sodium inside the cell in order to activate like. So it only needs to have a higher concentration when it's generating an action. So you're going to use the ATP every time you need to generate an action potential to then pump the sodium in order to, and then have to pump it out in order to reset the. Okay, so why not do that? Why not do it? And also, it's not 
it actually doesn't take much more energy because you can say that you, you can use the same amount of ATP. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's a lot of uh, a matter of kinetics. Okay, like it it has a lot to do with kinetics. So you the cell what it actually does here with the ATP pumps is that it and you write about the action potential, but this is also uh, but actually the cells and other other cells that don't generate action potentials also have these concentration gradients. That actually the neuron just uh, probably later in evolution adapted this property in order to, to facilitate the action potentials, but the, the concentration gradient is not for action potential. Actually, I think the best metaphor to describe why we need this uh, concentration differences is a battery. Okay, So what the set actually does is, like I told you before, the ATP is very... Uh, the, the, these pumps are actually very slow because they have to have a draw of ATP and they have to have a conformational change and they're also very, have, uh, they need to be very specific. So, for specific types of molecules. But a lot of the function of the cell, <coughs> which you will see later, harness the energy of the, of, the, of the concentration gradient for a lot of different cellular functions. So uh, you, actually, you can actually think about it, that these pumps are actually converting the energy of ATP in the form of potential energy that is a, uh, that is implemented into these concentration gradients. And this is actually what you have in a battery. If you know like a little bit of electricity, then you understand that in, in a battery you have a separation of, uh, of charges between one plate and the other plate, and the, the actually the flow uh, of the charge and the flow of the electrons uh, inside the battery, or ions, it depends which type of battery, uh, is actually what gives you the energy. But when a battery is charged, then you have actually a concentration gradient or concentration difference in the charges on one side, and uh, like negative charges on one side and positive charges on the other side. And when you break this barrier, then you allow the flow. So this is actually very similar to a battery, which is actually which is really interesting because it's like a again uh, a lot of time in biology we find that biology has already found solutions like. Uh, millions of years ago to things that just now we started to uh, we started implementing so i found i found a nice movie it's not completely scientific like you'll see so it doesn't really show the molecular structure uh, of the uh, it doesn't really show the molecular structure of the atp um, sodium potassium pump but because it shows the conformational change, and I, I still think it's uh, it's nice to show. So these are like the different components. The pump are mimicked in this model through a series of gears and ratchets. The sodium potassium pump is an active transport process used in cells to maintain a resting potential along the plasma membrane by transferring ions against their concentration gradients. To accomplish this, three sodium ions bind to the protein in its resting position. A phosphate from ATP then binds to the protein providing the energy needed to change the shape of the protein channel. The sodium ions are then released, resulting in a high concentration of sodium ions outside the cell. Two potassium ions then bind to the activated protein. Since the protein channel needs to return to its resting position, no energy is needed, so the phosphate is released. The concentration of potassium ions increases inside the cell as the potassium ions are released from the protein. As this process is repeated, an electrochemical gradient is created which is utilized for a host of cellular functions. Okay, so you see it's really similar to what you can think about uh, as a battery. And I really think about it as like a, a readily supply of energy. So, And actually in cells that you see, like for example when we record from... Uh, from neurons and the neurons are starting to die and they're starting to show like uh, problems the first thing that you see is that the resting potential or the membrane potential starts like starts uh, going down like in the in the polarity of it like uh, normally the resting potential is like minus 70 uh, millivats or minus 60 and uh, when the cell starts dying it starts climbing to minus 40 minus 30 and in the end the cell just uh, it dies so it's a really uh, one of the basic uh, properties of the cell, and cells that don't have the concentration gradient uh, cannot actually function. And the energy is only used for the sodium transport, not potassium? Um, it's, a, it's actually not needed for neither, it's just the energy is needed for the conformational change. Right. 
It just happens that the, the sodium is there, and then the conferential change happens, and then it's released. But the, the entire process is dependent on the conformational change that is guided by the ATP. So in muscles, again, because it's a good example, but you can also find structures that are similar to this in, uh, in the nerve cells and, mus and, uh, uh, and in neurons. So if this is a muscle fiber and these are, uh, <coughs> or this is like a muscle uh, cell, it's actually like a zoom into just a single uh, muscle cell. So this is the nucleus of the cell. You can see that the cell looks very different from the cell that you saw before because not not a very typical cell. So the entire muscle cells is composed of fibers of actin, uh, actin and myosin. And like I showed you before that uh, guided by the power of ATP, um, they... Uh, they uh, induce like contraction movement through motor proteins that know how to do this contraction. But I also showed you that what actually triggers this contraction <coughs> is a massive influx of calcium. And this calcium is actually is not coming from outside the cell. The calcium is actually stored in a special type of organelle that's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, which is actually surrounds like it's, uh, it's everywhere in the cell, in the, in the muscle cell. And the way that the cell maintains high concentration of uh, calcium uh, inside, uh, inside the sarcoplasmic reticulums is very, very similar to the same uh, through an ATP-powered uh, pump that in this case uh, only transports calcium, like two, two uh, calcium ions, from the cytosol or the cytoplasma to the lumen of the SR. So in this case, it's not from intracellular to, uh, to extracellular. It's from, uh, from the space of the cell to the space of the organelle, okay? And, but the, the way it does it, it's very similar. It's actually identical. The only thing that's different is the, the binding site or the identity uh, of the ions that bind to, the, uh, to these clefts. And this is a model uh, that shows you like how actually, uh, how this pump looks like uh, in reality. So this is the nucleotide, and nucleotide is ATP because it's a type of nucleotide. So it's a nucleotide binding site, the phosphorylation domain, which uh, receives the phosphate. Uh, and this is like described, this is the cytosol, and this is the uh, SR lumen, uh, for example, uh, in this case. And again, because I really like uh, movies, this is actually a very boring movie, but, uh, uh, but still. It's a, it's a nice animation that shows you the, uh, this structure. And I like it, and I like it because it's like, okay, don't move. I'm not gonna press anything. So because it's like, you see what, what actually happens in reality. Like I always tell you, proteins are always breathing and moving. It's not like a, it's like, not like a fixed uh, thing. Like you see in uh, these, uh, uh, in these images. But actually what you can see uh, in this uh, nice model, this nice representation, is the differences between the E1 state where the cleft is pointing towards the cytosol and the E2 state where the cleft is open towards the lumen, okay? So, why is it not working? Okay, so, this is the E1 phase, like the when, when the channel is, uh, uh, the, the cleft is pointing to one the cytosol, and the E2 is when the channel is open towards the lumen. So, and you can see that the actual, there is a massive conformational change that happens in this site after the, the phosphorylation that causes this shift. This whole like area over here is like moving here. And actually when you look at it, there's almost none of the, none of the structures stays the same, okay? And the, the point that I want to, that I want to uh, transmit to you here is that it's not uh, like a simple, when you think about, uh, when you tr when, when, if you will, uh, try to like engineer something like that, you will think about like uh, making a hole and making the part of the hole like open and something will pass through it. And in biology, it really doesn't work that way. Often these conformational changes are affecting the entire protein. Okay, because you can see that the protein, like I uh, almost in every location that you look here, there's been a shift in the structure of the protein. So this is a massive conformational change that happens in order to, to make this, 
to make this pocket and face the other way around. Okay, so that, that was the ATP powered pumps. Now, non gated ion channels uh, and the resting membrane potential, and you'll see why we talk about these two uh, in the same section. Uh, this is because the non gated ion channel, specifically the potassium non gated ion channel, is the one that's responsible uh, for the membrane potential. Okay, for the actual uh, for the actual membrane potential, and uh, and now I will say something. Maybe I'll, I'll leave it for a few seconds. But uh, so channel proteins in general are, uh, are proteins that do not require any uh, any energy for them to uh, uh, to operate, and because they don't require energy and they not uh, they do not undergo any conformational change, like massive conformational change, they're very fast. Okay, so. Think about the example before when you saw the ATP, uh, the ATP powered pump. It has to like bind to the ATP, phosphorylation. Then you have uh, this massive conformation change, and then you had, uh, has to wait for the uh, the ions to diffuse to the other side. In this case, it's just a, you can imagine it as just a, like a hole or a channel or a tube uh, inside the membrane that just allows uh, a free movement of the specific ions. But the fact that it allows uh, movement of the molecules or ions doesn't mean that it's not specific. One of the nicest examples of uh, of this channel uh, of, of this channel is the uh, non-gated or resting K channel. It's called in uh, um, like in common uh, in common terms, and this channel is made out of uh, four subunits uh, that are uh, identical to one another. It's a, actually it's a, uh, it's a it's a it's a homo tetramer, and <coughs> uh, the one that uh, discovered this channel and uh, and uh, described the selectivity filter specifically, uh, this channel won the Nobel Prize uh, for this uh, discovery, and this channel is actually uh, it's a channel that's open all the time and it allows more or less free passage of uh, potassium ions. <coughs> From uh, from the cytosol, okay, because we have a lot, uh, high concentration of uh, potassium in the cytosol, to the exterior part of the cell. Okay, so there are con there is a constant movement of ions uh, through this channel from the cytosol uh, to the exterior uh, part of the cell. But one of the things that you should be worried about, if you know a little bit uh, chemistry and uh, uh, and physics is that how exactly is this channel specific to potassium? Because, and I'm sure all of you know it, that sodium is much smaller than potassium. Okay, like this is a positively charged ion, this is a positively charged ion, but sodium, and this is, the, this is like the size or indication of the molecular weight uh, of, the, of this element, so a sodium ion is much smaller than a potassium ion. So how is it possible for uh, like the identically charged, uh, um, identically charged atom or ion uh, to pass to not pass through the channel, and a larger one to uh, that will be able to pass through the channel. So the way it actually happens is again, like in a lot of cases, like I told you in uh, in biology and in cellular biology, water is in charge of this uh, of this amazing phenomenon, and actually. If we go back to the, and we look from an upper view on this, uh, on the hole or the, on the, uh, or the channel uh, inside, uh, inside this protein that's created for the, for the potassium, we can see that the potassium is in very close proximity for, with these, what we call like these segments that are called selectivity filter. And why are these called selectivity filter? <coughs> Molecularly, if we look close into, this, uh, into these pores, then what we find is that we have this uh, special conformation of oxygens that are sticking towards the, uh, actually, you can see it uh, the best here. Like you have, if we look at it molecularly, then these are marking oxygens. So you have, and now you just see two units, but there are, other, there are two other units in this part and uh, inside the board. But you have four oxygens, 
And these four oxygens uh, are interacting specifically in a, in a very tight way with the potassium ion. <coughs> but in the case of the sodium ion, these four oxygens, because, they're, because this is the exact space between them, and they're, again, it's a rigid structure, like the relatively rigid, uh, because the protein is actually what, uh, what I'm not showing you here is the, the entire protein backbone that is holding these oxygens. So these oxygens do not, only, only two of them can interact tightly with the sodium ion because it's smaller than the potassium ion. And because of that, and again, this is where water comes into play, I told you that the ions are not in vacuum. They're not like, they're always coated with a, with a layer of water. They're always hydrated with water molecules that are surrounding them. So if we now want to think about the sodium, <coughs> sodium ion floating around the solution, and now it has to transfer from the solution through the pore, so it has to get rid of the water molecules that, that, is, uh <coughs> that is surrounding it. But the problem is that with the water molecules, it has four water molecules that are bound to it. And in this case, it only has two oxygens that it interacts with. So actually, this interaction is much more stable than this interaction. And because of that, it will, uh, it will never choose to be in this type of interaction and not in this type of interaction. And the water will never fully release this ion in order for it to pass through the channel. And in the case of the potassium, the actual the, the space uh, between the oxygen is is such that uh, the transition from the water from the um, hydrated state to the channel pore is mu is much more smooth. And in this case, um, there is no like specific preference for the ion to interact with these four oxygens or to interact with the four oxygens uh, of the water. It's actually eight. But uh, here, we, for simplicity, we, we see only four. But it's the same thing. Okay? Is that clear? Question about that? So we see that, uh, again, because of water and because of the interaction with water, uh, biology found a way to only, in, or to only cause like a specific type of ion or to, to allow uh, to allow interaction with a specific type of ion and not, for example, with a larger ion or even with a smaller ion. So this is why it's called the selectivity filter and it's one of the most uh, interesting uh, structures that we find. And this is an illustration of how uh, exactly this happens. So uh, because there, here you see the eight water molecules that are surrounding the potassium ion. So uh, they actually like change hands between the oxygens that are inside the pore of the protein. And each time, uh, and during, during the passage of the, uh, of the potassium ion through the channel, it always has to interact with four oxygens. So you, you don't have like this state where you have like four uh, potassium ions simultaneously moving through the channel. There's always be like two potassium ions that will pass through the channel. Uh, always interacting with eight uh, oxygens uh, surrounding them. Okay? Yeah. So wait, the oxygens are attached to the... Are oxygen part of the protein. They're lining the... The, um, the pore. The they're lining the pore. So they're not, they're interacting with it, but they're part of the protein. But what's the, what's the, what causes this, uh, this filter is the unique position of them, so they would only interact with a uh, only interact with an ion that's exactly in the size of potassium. If it would be a little bit larger, they won't interact because they won't pass. And if it would be a little bit smaller, like in the case of the sodium, uh, bec uh, the sodium will always prefer to be in the hydrated state, and then it will never pass uh, through this through this pore. Okay, so. This channel is actually uh, what helps to maintain the differences in or the membrane potential, like the minus 60 or minus 70 uh, membrane potential. And again, this uh, I understand that this will go a little bit against uh, your intuition because we said, and also I'm sure that you were a little bit easy, uh, uneasy before when I told you about this channel because the cell invests so much energy in making this concentration difference. And then it makes a channel that allows free leakage of uh, potassium. But actually, the concentration gradient 
is not what is responsible, like the concentration gradient is the source of energy, but it is not the source of the electrochemical, uh, it's not the source of the memory potential. Okay, so these are actually two separate things. You have the concentration gradient, which is actually something that is very constant. It will actually never change, more or less. And we will see examples of that. Examples of that. The cell, even, t even with an action potential, even with everything you heard, the concentration gradients or the, concentra the relative concentration of potassium and sodium inside the cell and outside the cell will never change dramatically. What will change is the membrane potential or the membrane electric potential. So how exactly does, his, does this happen? If we like invent this artificial system that we will make an impermeable barrier that represents the, uh, represents the cell membrane here, and we will put here, uh, similar to what, to what we have in the cell, low concentration of sodium and high concentration uh, of uh, potassium, and each one of these ions we're gonna contradict with the same concentration of chloride ion. Okay, so this is actually similar to what happens in the cell, but in the cell there are a lot of different types of molecules that contradict the charge. But in terms of concentrations, you still have much more potassium inside the cell than you have outside the cell. Okay, so you can agree with me that in this situation, all the positive charges are balanced with negative charges and the net potential, uh, uh <coughs> the electrical potential is zero because there is no differences in charge between them. But now, what will happen if we introduce into this uh, impermeable uh, barrier, we introduce a, a channel that is only specific for potassium. What will happen now is that the potassium will want to start moving because it will start moving down its concentration gradient, which is in this direction, and will start moving from this uh, compartment to this compartment. But when will it stop moving? because there is another force that is starting to work, to, uh, to work now, because when only the potassium ions are moving to, towards this direction, this, uh, this compartment is starting to be more positively charged, because we have only positive ions that are moving to this direction. And because of that, we know that another fundamental uh, law of physics is that, uh, that opposite, ch opposite charges uh, attract each other, and the same charges, um, how would you say? repel each other, yeah. So eventually what will happen is that the potassium will be like the, the force that drives the, the, the concentration force that will drive uh, the potassium from here to here will be balanced out by an electrical force and this hence the electrochemical gradient uh, that will push it back uh, towards this direction. And this balance is actually, uh, we find that in the concentration that we find in the cell, this very simple system or the, the presence of the single channel is, is more or less enough uh, to explain the differences in, in, uh, in potential or in uh, electrical potential that we find between the internal parts of the cell and the external part of the cell, okay? And this is actually one of the, the first examples that you see of how the cell can harness the, the concentration gradient as an energy source to maintain electrical potential gradient or electrical potential difference. Because if the cell didn't have this concentration difference, it, it would have no way to, to create this uh, electrical difference, okay? So I know it's a, it can be a little bit confusing because a lot of times these terms are intermixed, but uh, this isn't generally what happened. This is, again, it's not unique to neurons. It happens in all the cells. But the neurons specifically use it for um, for a lot of different functions, but also for action potentials. Okay. So a few words about transporters. So <coughs> uniporters transport uh, single types of molecule down its concentration gradient. This is very similar to what we saw in channels, but the major difference is that every ion or every molecule that has to, to pass through here, uh, it has to inflict a conformational change in the uniporter, so that's why it's much slower. Actually, I'll show you in the, in the end, we'll talk about the kinetics. <coughs> and uh, antiporters and symporters use energy either from, uh, symporter is when uh, the concentration gradients, it's actually, it's again, confusing in name, 
But thin portal is when the concentration gradients are inverse, then the two molecules will move in the same direction because one is, uh, one is uh, giving energy and the, the other one is using the energy. And the antiporter is the other way around, but actually the concentration gradients of the two ions or two molecules will be in the same direction. So one of the classic examples of how the cell uses these uh, transporter system is actually to maintain the pH of the cell. So the bicarbonate ion, which is a basic, uh, which is actually a base, so if the cell has a lot of bicarbonate, uh, it, will move towards <coughs> it will move towards this direction. And if it has a lot of, uh, uh, if it has less bicarbonate and more free hydrogens, it will move in this direction. Okay, so again, I remind you that uh, when we're talking about pH, low pH means a high concentration of hydrogen ions. And the bicarbonate ion interacts with hydrogen and actually uh, <coughs> it converts it like a, uh, to water, and this is why uh, water and CO2, and this is and, and this is why it like uh, neutralizes uh, the acidity. So, actually, these transporters can be uh, because they're because I told you that their function is dependent on the conformational change, and you know that proteins. I hope that by now you know you get, or maybe you have an intuition that proteins in different pH will have different. Uh, will have different structures or different 3D uh, structure because the concentration of hydrogen is critical for the interaction of amino acids and critical for the for the folding. And for example, if I if I add uh, uh, in an enough acidic environment, all the proteins will be uh, denatured. Or in enough basic uh, in a in a very basic environment, also the proteins uh, will suffer from structural changes. So in this case. Each one of these transporters actually becomes active at a different pH. Okay. So, in, if we're in very acidic pH, what uh, what this transporter does? It actually uses again sodium, so it harnesses the 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 concentration gradient again because it 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 takes sodium uh, that is highly concentrated outside the cell and put and, and drives it inside the cell and uses that energy in order to start pumping hydrogen ions out of the cell in order to raise the pH, okay? And when the pH rises uh, additionally, then these, uh, this transporter starts uh, to become active. And because this transporter is active, then it, uh, it helps this transporter. And uh, by using the chloride, which is actually the, the concentration of chloride is, uh, is high inside the cell and the concentration of uh, sodium uh, <coughs> uh, is uh, is low, so it uses actually uh, it couples the movement of sodium and uh, bicarbonate ion inside the cell, and it couples it together with the chloride ion that that goes out from the cell, and because uh, and so it actually elevates the concentration of the bicarbonate ions inside the cell, and the bicarbonate uh, interacts with the free hydrogens and drives the pH further towards the uh, uh, towards like the physiological pH, with the, which is around this area. So what happens actually if the cell uh, is too basic, or there is too uh, uh, the the pH is too basic, which is high, then this transporter becomes very active again. I don't know if I, but this is like the this is a graph that describes the percent of activity of the transporter. So when the pH is very uh, is very basic then this, this transporter becomes very active. And, uh, <coughs> and, and then it starts pumping uh, bicarbonate ions outside of the cell, lowering the pH. So you can see that actually what we find is, is that in order to maintain steady state or to maintain the, the constant pH of the cell, you need the action, the combined action of these two uh, antiporters that are actually competing against uh, another but their activity is also dependent on the pH. So it's like a feedback system, a very complex feedback system that, uh, that really regulates the activity of each one of these transporters and helping the cell to maintain a constant pH. Okay? Question? So, aquaporins, we'll say, how much time do you have? No, no. 
just say a few words about aquaporins. There's not a lot to say about them, actually. So they're just channels that allow, uh, that allow water to freely move uh, through them. Uh, again, a lot of time we find these as uh, like a tetrameric uh, proteins that have these uh, hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic channels uh, that allow the water to pass uh, through the membrane. Uh, the way that the cell actually uh, uh, that the cell actually uh, controls the, the amount of uh, water that can that can penetrate is by controlling the amount of channels that it has. Some cells have more aquaporins, some cells uh, have less aquaporins, and uh, not enough to say uh, from that. Uh, and we're not going to talk about the selectivity filter uh, in the water, but there's also a selectivity filter that only permits uh, for water, but also some small molecules can also pass uh, through this uh, uh, through this pore. Okay, so I'll just say a few words and then we'll finish and we'll continue uh, in two weeks about voltage-gated ion channels, which obviously are very important for uh, neurons. So voltage-gated ion channels uh <coughs> are channels that have uh, a specific, uh, uh, like a blockage, we still say that it's a passive channel, okay? So in the separation of what we did before between a passive channel and an active channel, uh, a gated ion channel will still be passive because the movement of the ions themselves does not require energy. For the, for the gating itself, sometimes uh, it requires energy for the opening of, the, of, the, uh, of this block or the opening of the gate sometimes requires energy, but not always. And, uh, but the movement of the ions themselves does not require energy, and this is also one of the reasons that, that it's so fast. So in neurons, and this is the most basic uh, model, we said that the potassium channel is open all the time, uh, but the sodium channels are actually closed uh, most of the time. That's also not very accurate. This is a statistical thing, but the sodium uh, channels are closed <coughs> if the membrane is in, uh, in, in the resting state. So when the charges change from being positive and negative here, the difference between positive and negative changes to negative and positive. And actually, you don't have to have this dramatic change, but it's enough to, for this region to become less negative and this region to become less positive. Then there is a conformational change that happens that opens uh, these channels and allows free uh, movement of sodium from the external part of the cell uh, to the internal part of the cell or to the cytosol with the concentration gradient, okay? So normally this uh, depolarization happens like when you have synaptic input or an action potential or uh, <coughs> other things that I'm not going to actually get.